Welcome back to a very special Q&A extravaganza. We got so many questions during our My Hero Academia manga fight that we couldn't possibly use them all for the show, so we're answering all of them here. With us today, back again, is Jeff Ruberg, mobile developer for Wiz Media. Hey, I'm excited to talk about more of My Hero Academia. And we've also got Doctor, host of the Ask Backwards Anime Podcast and Justin Gintama Podcast. Hey, well, I'm glad to be back. Awesome. I'm glad to have you guys back to talk some more MHA. And we've got a lot of questions, about two dozen questions. And we've got them from all sorts of various places. The One Dream Adventure Reward Forums, Animation Revelation, and Reddit. So, we're going to start off with the questions from the One Dream Adventure Reborn Forums. Starting off with a question from Wensleydale Cheddar. Who asks... I'm not going to make you come up with an entire Pokemon team for everybody, but give every member of Class 1A in MHA a partner Pokemon. <laughs> now, there are like 20 students in Class 1A. Uh, <laughs> what do you say, guys? Do you want to do the challenge, or do you want to just choose one student uh, to give a Pokemon to? I mean, probably like, can you get like maybe five? I think. <laughs> you want to do five each? What's the maximum of, 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 of a team? Six? Uh, yeah, six. Right? Okay, let's go with six. I think that would make things Six easier. characters total or six characters each? Uh, no, six characters total. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think we can do s- <laughs> every character have six big Pokemon. That's a bit much. <laughs> All right. So divided between the four of us, I guess we'll just we'll throw whatever we can think about there. So let's see. Hmm. I think an obvious one would be like Purim when, ref- uh, when merged with Reshiram for like Todoroki. Maybe that's a little too powerful of a Pokemon to give him, but like Fire Ice combo, <laughs> you know? that That's pretty appropriate. Is there another Fire Ice type that's not Kirin? It, it, does giving Suyu Politoed like, too obvious? <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of frog Pokemon <laughs> yeah. you could give her. Uh, but, yeah, that's a good one. Actually, no, Greninja would be way more appropriate, because Greninja has that long tongue. <laughs> and it's really acrobatic. It would be fun to see her do like, Greninja's poses, like have her tongue wrapped around her yeah. body and stuff. <laughs> wrapped around like a scarf around her neck. <laughs> That's great. I feel like the answers I'm thinking of are all like, you know, just based on their, like what mirrors the, the, the character, which isn't really how like Pokemon and trainers work. So, hmm. you know, Endeavor sort of looks like Magmortar, so I'm going to give him Magmortar. <laughs> Magmortar, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. Oh, sn- f- Snorlax and Fat Gum, obvious. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, okay, that, that's, that's not a bad one. I guess would it make sense to give um, Midoriya like one of the fighting types, like maybe maybe Hitmonlee or? I think Tyrogue would actually be appropriate for Midoriya. Okay, I can see that. Right. How about for Bakugo? Is uh, have it be a Voltorb that only knows explosion? <laughs> That'd be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That would be perfect. I can't believe I didn't think about that one. <laughs> Is that six? Hmm. Maybe. I, I, I was just like throwing stuff there at that point. Throwing stuff at the wall. Okay, so let's think of one more, maybe. Okay. Hmm. I I want to give I want to give Mineta a Digimon. <laughs> okay. To subvert this question. Um, but the problem is most people have applied on this Digimon. Um, most. Oh my god, this Digimon is so weird. I'll link to it in our in our Slack so you can see. But um. It's a, oh my, so got, uh-huh. most people probably know Gatamon. And Gatamon is the yeah. cat Digimon yeah. that uh, Kari has in season one and season two. Um, this is Betsumon, which is a, um, like, looks like, a, looks like a creepy old man cosplaying as a oh, cat. What? <laughs> cosplaying as Gatamon. And it is, it Look is, at that ball, it is super Jonathan. creepy and, <laughs> oh yeah. And that, that's what I imagine Mineta, um, yeah, that's, that's his, a... like, spirit animal. It's a. Well, you have one, one for his belly button and the one for. <laughs> his ability is to cosplay as other. Digimon, that's freaking great. Oh, this no. has two bulges. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's terrible and amazing. <laughs> and he's based on a cosplayer. Huh. Wow. Yeah, I feel bad. I feel bad for the cosplayer who, like. Why? He, now he's immortalized in ca- Digimon canon. I might have to watch Digimon Fusion just for this character. Does he appear a lot? No, it's like one episode, okay. one, one off villain. Ah. Uh, well, uh, I'll watch that episode. 
Yes, so let's move on to the next question from June Maywell, who asks, who do we think the traitor is? Now, we answered this question in the manga fight, but he also asks, who would be your best guess if the traitor was someone from Class B? Which is a little interesting. Hmm. Class B. Uh... I think the problem is we don't really know too many of the characters in Class B. But uh, the, like, American transfer student, like, the her name is Pony or something? Maybe that could be a fun yes, twist. All, like all Americans are secretly uh, villains. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I it would be kind of interesting. I, have we haven't the one who's like listed on the the Wikia page as being Manga Fukidashi. I don't remember when they've appeared, but maybe their power is they can read the manga itself to find out what's going on, and that's how they're <laughs> that's how they're betraying everyone and leaking information. Is this how I get those my Boku no Hero Academia scandalations like a week early because of this guy? I think just the idea in general is interesting. It's not something that we were really thinking about, but it could very well be possible. I just think uh, we might need to learn a little more about Class 1B because we only knew a couple of the characters from there. What characters are from Class B? I, I, need, I need a bit of a, ref- of a refresher. Tetsu, 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 Tetsu. Okay, the class from um, from the sports festival. Okay, I remember now. What about the mind control guy? I don't think he was from that class. Shinzo? He's not in Class 1B. He was a general studies student. Okay. Yeah, I think he's the only general studies student really now. It was that girl with the mushroom haircut. Mm-hmm. There's the girl who had the wines on the ha- for hair, rather. Oh yeah, Ibarra, Shiozaki. And Monoma is the guy who's like always like trying to prove that Class One B is better to Class One A, and like laughs at their failures, even though he's kind of like pathetic in himself or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I think I remember a few gags with him. He was pretty funny. I'm having trouble remembering what suggestions we came up with last time. Even I don't think we even had. I mean, it was no one from Class B. Specifically, I mean, I came up with a teacher. Uh, yeah, you came up with thirteen, and Jeff came up with Tokiomi Shadow. Yeah, this is a very out there theory, <laughs> but that that could st- <laughs> that could still work somehow. Yeah, I'm just thinking, like in terms of if if it were someone from Class B, then it seems like it would be some kind of um, you know, like there'd be a bigger plot about the the ranking of the classes and the kind of like. Like the stuff that kind of came up in that sports social arc with the uh, the Class B students trying to prove themselves and the general studies guy who wanted to show that Class A wasn't so hot. And it's like, mm-hmm. I, I could see that if, if uh, Horikoshi Sensei wanted to go in direction of like, you know, kind of undermining the ranking system, like something like Assassination Classroom does. But it's kind of, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't seem the kind of thing the series does. It's like, yeah, they, they shouldn't undervalue the people in the lower classes and the, the people who didn't get into the, the top of the hero class, but they don't like... It's not really about that system itself being unjust, and I kind of struggle. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I feel like that's where it'd have to go if they made one of the other class uh, people from the other class to be the traitor. It would probably be about them, you know, being frustrated with being behind and everything. And I don't know. It just feels like my hero academia is not so cynical, or like, like it, it has like an optimism about these institutions instead of a pessimism and cynicism about them. So yeah, but thinking about it, I think Monoma probably could be the most likely candidate for being the traitor from Class 1B, just because yeah. he hates Class A 1A so much. It's true. Like, <laughs> I, just, I just hope I hope my hair academia isn't so cynical to... Because they did that, did that but yeah. with the, um, the general studies guy, like, they... I was like, okay, he's clearly a traitor, but then, like, they, they he he looks shady, he, he acts a little bit shady, and they, like, made that a part of his, like, he gets, you know, typecast, not typecast, but stereotyped because of that, and that's mm-hmm. part of his character, mm-hmm. and I, I like how it kind of expected that reaction, and took it a level beyond that by dealing with that. Yeah. Uh, I think those are some good suggestions, though, that we threw out there best we can for Class 1B Trader. But uh, I guess we'll move on to questions from Animation Revelation. First up, we've got a set of questions from Dr. Insatsu Ken. Starting off, what with the popularity of superhero team-up movies and shows such as The Avengers, Defenders, Justice League, The CW, DC Wars, and so on, Pitch a four-person team of any four heroes, students or pros, with a unique name for their team and why they would work well together. That's a t- that's a crazy one. Uh... <laughs> I actually, I wrote one down before because I was afraid this was going to be a debate question. And I was like, oh no, I need to <laughs> defend this. <laughs> um, so my team was, and this is only probably that useful if you're looking at the list of characters on the uh, 
the Boku no Hero Academia wiki wikia. But um, so so my four person team was the the principal, recovery girl, the invisible girl, and the speech bubble girl, the manga Fukidashi, and just just the the assortment of the the weirdest random <laughs> characters that everyone overlooks. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be fun. Now, now, what would their team name be? Uh, <laughs> I struggle with that. I think I, I think I was gonna go with the Invisibles, and then like Invisible Girl would be the the, the kind of the, the poster child. So like right. the center of every image of them as t- like you know posing would we'll just have this in, you know, pair of clothes in the middle. Hmm. Man, I don't know. I I feel like my choices would be kind of boring. I would just I would just go with a lot of the main characters. I would just want to see Deku, uh, Uraraka, Ida. Bakugo and uh, maybe Kirishima there because you know because uh, Bakugo can't get go anywhere without his precious Kirishima according to fandom. <laughs> 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 and m- maybe maybe have Aizawa lead the team. I think I think that would make for an interesting team up. Mm-hmm. I came up with one. Suyu Mineta. Sh- uh, I forget his actual name, but Sugar Man and Fat Gum. Uh, they could all be a team and call themselves Sticky Squad. Is that that's, they that, all, that's unfortunate. They, they all their abilities all involve like sticking to things in some way or form. Okay, like Suyu, like Suyu has like you know a frog, like suction things on her fingertips or whatever. And then Mineta's abilities like those sticky balls. Sugar Man, you know that's that's sugar. Sugar is sticky when it's uh, <laughs> that, that one is self explanatory. And Fat Gum. I mean, I can imagine he eats a lot of sticky things, but also, like, if you get caught in his fat, you're stuck to him. So, there you go. <laughs> That's actually pretty good, actually. That's the, you, you centered it around a theme. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but my, mine was basically the main character squad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about uh, you, Doctor? Do you have an idea? I, I you know, That's a funny thing. Like, I was kind of looking through, and it's tough for me to, like, go offhand just the... Uh, off the cuff on this one, I, I would like to see like maybe like a like an old female team of some sort, just for differentiation of uh, most of the usual kind of uh, superhero teams you'll see. Okay, it happens every once in a while in comics, but you don't really see it that often. Um, okay, then then which I, I guess which female characters would you like to see team up? Uh, I think best girl. Uh, <laughs> actually, all all of our best girls. I would even go, I would go with like. Uh, so you, Momo, I'll even put in Jiro for that one, because I think they would actually work together very well. And maybe, maybe Uraraka actually being somewhat of a team leader would actually work for that. Uraraka better be in there. <laughs> <laughs> I said a uh, team of best girls, you know. I'll call them best girls. What? You don't, you don't want to call them girl power because they're girls? And no. And, and, and girl is an automatopoeia because, you know, whatever? <laughs> No, I I, just, I, we, they should just be called the best girls, you know. The best yeah. girls. That, that should be their actual. <laughs> I think there's a, there's enough there that you can have like f- like hand to hand like v- like range combat between between the four of them. They could work well. Momo's level headed enough. Furudaka is sort of like leader who got recruited uh, as a leader by accidental votes, and <laughs> now she's struggling to figure out how to become the leader, kind of thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You know, the ED theme of the current season shows all the female characters in 1A, you know, together, and, like, they're all, f- and, like, there's images of them fighting villains all together. Like, I think they could work well together as a group. It'd be fun to, like, have an arc where they're all in a team together, and they're, and they're all fighting the, whatever villain of the arc is. I like it with one tweak. I think, I think it would be, um, it would be, it would still be called Best Girls, and mm-hmm. it would be, um, Uraka. Uh, Momo, Suyu, and Stain. Ah. And it just it ne- ne- never, never be explained. Just like Stain's just on the team. They, they, they need to form the, the squad to do whatever mission. Like he has some information. They get him out of whatever like quirk jail. And okay. And it's just like is in all the promotional images and stuff. It's best girls, and everyone's like, wait, why Stain there? And it'd be great. <laughs> okay, that works. Yeah, I could always use more Stain. I'll take whatever opportunity to get more of him. <laughs> okay, I think that answers that question. So moving on, should Vigilante ever canonically cross over with MAJ in a major storyline for either series, or is it better for it to remain strictly a complimentary spinoff with the occasional cameo? Dude, so do you guys know what um, My Hero Academia Vigilante is at all? Or I'm only slightly aware of it. Yeah, I only know some of it. 
or I don't know something little bits about it. Yeah, the title is pretty self-explanatory. It's about a group of three characters who aren't like officially recognized heroes, but they perform vigilante work. So they're kind of like uh of the MHA superheroes are like regulated supermen, like they're the Batman. Yeah, unfortunately, like I don't I don't really know much about it personally outside of its premise cuz it's I don't think it's legally available. I'm sure it's probably been scanned somewhere, but I just haven't really bothered to, like, actually look it up. So I unfortunately don't really have much of an opinion on it. Personally, I think that some elements from Vigilante could cross over with MHA, but maybe, like, doing, like, a super interconnected thing wouldn't work out and they should remain their own separate entities for the most part just because after seeing all the backlash towards the light novel uh thing with black clover you know <laughs> I, I think that kind of would frustrate people if mha tried the same thing even if it was a manga spin-off. oh yeah i know what you mean like just 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 introduce these characters from like another thing and just be like hey remember all those adventures we went out together yeah hey you, you remember that readers yeah you'd remember that if you read all the supplementary material that you can <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, uh, l- 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 link to it below yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I that, was, that was the thing was in my recent memory. So I was like, I don't know if a crossover like that would ever work because that's like what I think of recently. Um, but I think, I don't know, I, I, have, I have more confidence in Horikoshi Sensei to, to um, I mean, the series is already kind of like lean. So if you just look at the character page, like there, there are so many characters who have been introduced once or twice and like they, they just make a little cameo and then you don't see them very much for a while. And I think it would totally fit in to, to have, I mean, I, I also haven't read the the series but i imagine there are characters who can make an appearance who could like make an impression on deku like you know have a couple scenes with him and then disappear and then you know like if you want to follow their story more go read this that's a very very comic booky way of uh working around that yeah mm-hmm. and it's like there there was a theme that i think hasn't really been addressed since the uh stain arc i think was when it was when i was thinking about it when like they all get reprimanded or in trouble for for like acting as heroes when they weren't you know like officially licensed and stuff and for for a while i mean i think there have been like hints at that kind of theme since then but it hasn't really been the focus and i kind of wondered back then like if that was like if that where the series is that's that is that where it's going is that is that it, is it going in a place where it's like the institutions that enforce these strict regulations are the problem and they're the actual things that need to be taken down it's like i don't think the series is really about that so I think it makes sense to kind of keep that those themes, those like you know working outside the law themes in in in, in spinoff series. But it'll be it'll be interesting if like the next time that comes around the main series to not focus on it there, but to be like, oh yeah, here here are these characters that embody that. If you want to read more about that, go go check out other series. Yeah, I, I think that's mm-hmm. why stuff like like the Avengers and the Defenders are like they're like they're street level heroes as opposed to guys who fight like galactic clouds uh, <laughs> like you, you you need that separation every once in a while they'll have maybe have the occasional crossover of sorts just to have the characters show up and kind of interact with each other it, it'd be fun um but i don't think it necessarily needs to they need to combine both series you can have a little both if, if anything i figured maybe if, if this were ever to you know happen I feel like it would probably make the most sense to maybe have characters from Vigilante maybe make cameos in the same light as... uh, Because sometimes Horikoshi will have characters from his other series make cameos in My Hero Academia and sometimes even have an active role. Gangorka. Yeah, yeah. You know, characters specifically from Omagadoki Zoo which was his uh, his first series in Shonen Jump. So, like, as, as somebody who has read all that series and probably one of my like my favorite canceled series in jump that really should have like went on longer you know i'm 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 gl- i'm glad to see those characters there every once in a while and and, and like sid said gang orca what is he a killer whale i i forget what it was yeah, yeah that sounds right yeah <laughs> um <laughs> yeah you know he he was the guy who was leading uh, part of the uh, licensing exam at one point you know he was he was the villain of an arc in omagadoki zoo so i appreciated him mm-hmm. Not only having like a cameo, but kind of an act, a somewhat of an active role for a cameo in the, in My Hero Academia. So, you know that that kind of stuff is cool. So I I could see, like I said, if if they're gonna do any kind of like vigilante cameos, I could maybe see something like that. Maybe not something as active as that, but you know, maybe see them around like once or twice. Like, oh hey, it's it's that character from that one thing. I I read that one thing. 
you know, that that's cool. It's a fun thing. Yeah, I think that's the way to do it. I think that'd be probably the best way to handle it. Just kind of like a little bit of an extended cameo, but not like an active like interference with the main plot. Like the light novel characters from Black Clover. Yeah, or, yeah. And that arc they came in. Uh, yeah, I, I don't... Yeah, it'd be kind of weird for like the main character Vigilante to meet up with Midoriya and go, Oh yeah, I remember you. We bought that one person that one time. You know, that totally happened. <laughs> Yeah, not not to like pile on and like hate that 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 tie-in more, but I mean, it's like <laughs> that that, that uh, tie-in was very much like a kind of like a, like a telling instead of showing in terms of getting you interested in the light novel. It wasn't like introducing this cool concept that you, by its nature, by how cool it was, made you want to check it out. It was instead like in order to be caught up for what's going on now, you need to read this other thing, and so it was like it's like yeah, it's like ha, yeah. now they have to buy the light novel, right. <laughs> But I think to move on to the next question, if All Might had never met Midoriya, which UA student would be most deserving of inheriting One for All and why? Uh, I think the obvious choice is Mirio because, you know, he was originally the first candidate, you know, that uh, All Might and Sir I were considering. And based on what we've seen in the series, you know, he is an, of an upstanding character that you know, it has kind of the same beliefs in what a hero should be as Midoriya does. So, you know, I think, you know, he would be a very appropriate candidate. Well, I want to give another suggestion for how to change this question up. I think a more interesting question would be, if Midoriya wasn't chosen by All Might, who who would basically be the main character of My Hero Academia? Who would get to go on this hero's journey instead, in, in, I guess, instead of Midoriya? Oh, <sighs> Who's bland enough? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like if Bakugo didn't have a quirk, I feel like he'd be kind of an interesting character to take this journey on, especially since, you know, he's to an extent an, an All Might supporter. Yeah, I mean, without his without his quirk, he's just a massive asshole. Like, so it's, it would be <laughs> yeah. interesting to see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that kind of protagonist could definitely work. I mean, Tepu is about a character very much like Bakugo. I mean, she's kind of a willing protagonist in her own way, but uh, yeah, I mean, Bakugo, definitely an atypical uh, protagonist for a shonen jump manga, for sure. Uh, outside of that, obvious two choices that come to my head are like Uraraka and Todoroki, but at the same time, their stories feel kind of like, you've seen like these, how they would be as protagonists, kind of. What about Ida? Well, Ida, um, I don't know, though. Ida, could he carry his own series based on his personality as it is now. Hmm. I, I could I could see the emotional baggage of having his entire family be awesome heroes and him not having anything. Yeah. I think that's the like assuming he doesn't have a quirk. Um yeah. I think like he could he could yeah. possibly be one. But uh, I'm I'm sorry, Sid, what were you saying about Rodaka? <laughs> well I was just saying Uraraka is very similar in personality to Deku, so you know, it wouldn't really change much. Aside from the fact but that hey, he's female. We'd, we would have a female protagonist in a shonen series, which... We can't un, have that. Un, un, for, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. We, we got to follow the rules. Yeah. <laughs> didn't, you know, didn't you know how badly Part 6 bombed and jumped? Yeah, it's, it's, it's because a girl was the main character. I'm sorry, guys. I should know better. <laughs> oh. Huh. What about... Uh, guys, I think we're missing the obvious answer. What, what about Mineta? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> but it's, it's not. That would be a different kind of series. That would be a flat out comedy. But yeah, let let him just punch something, explode his arm, and he'd be gone for the rest of the manga. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, that that would be terrible. <laughs> yeah, Jeff, do you have any suggestions? Well, so so you're thinking of all these as like basically replacing Deku's role of like not having a quirk and then being chosen, getting a quirk. Is that how you're thinking about those? Yeah, answers? yeah, that's the closest way you can do it. Mm. Yeah, I think Ida is the, is the closest fit to that. I mean, like, there are a couple other characters I think would be interesting to be as main characters with their current, you know, situation. But I think, though, like, going from nothing to getting a bunch of power, to get getting powers and stuff, I think he's he's the best pick. Like, I mean, I think it would be cool to follow, like, hmm. Kirishima as a main character with his current set of abilities, but I don't think he really, he doesn't really fit. I don't think he'd be that great as a, uh, you know, star for nothing and you know, get his ability over the course of the series. So you suggested Todoroki, didn't you? Uh, yeah, but like I also said, like you kind of already know how Todoroki's story would kind of play out. I feel based on his personality. Yeah, and and, and I I could see it going where like 
I feel, I, I guess Todoroki's story probably wouldn't be too much different because, like, I guess it'd probably be even more tragic because, you know, his asshole dad tries to, like, groom him to be this really awesome hero to beat All Might, but tragic twist, he doesn't have a quirk, so, you know, he hates his son even more. So I think, I, I think, I guess with that, with that change in Todoroki's story, I think his story would just become even more sad and tragic and pr- pr- probably sad enough to not be able to run and jump, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> well, there is, there is the fact that, like, uh, Turok, or Shoto, whatever, ha- has, like, three siblings that we never, that don't matter at all because they don't have a quirk. So, like, I, I think mm. they could, they could fit into that where it's like, maybe things are reversed. Like, he is the, the sibling doesn't have a quirk, and there is an older sibling that is the one that's groomed to be the successor to Endeavor. And he kind of has to live in the shadow of that and being one of the three siblings that is not totally just a footnote. I feel that's how Sasuke started out, remembering his backstory. Mm. That, I think that's like Sasuke's start. Uh, J- 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 <laughs> J- Jeff is right. Clearly they don't matter because I'll be honest, I did. I don't even remember Todoroki having any siblings. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about it recently because I, th- I think they just, I'm not caught up in the anime, but I think they're, they were just like mentioned or revealed in the anime. And I've seen some people on Twitter being like, oh, I can't wait until we get more backstory. And then I'm like, oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, actually, uh, that sibling question, we have a follow up uh, from someone down the line about that. But okay. yeah, that means, so I think Todoroki could be interesting if he was in this position. Mm-hmm. But I feel like I think Horikoshi would really have to take it in a different direction, like yeah. having a a complex rivalry with his older brother, I feel, is just a little too similar to so many other shonen series. No, I, yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Sid, that I feel like if, if Todoroki were, were the main character of My Hero Academia, I feel like it, I feel like the series probably wouldn't be as unique. Mm-hmm. Or it wouldn't be as interesting, I don't think, unfortunately. This question, the original question, kind of uh, poses a question to me, which I'm curious what you guys think about, is like, because we've heard in the context of the story that All Might and Night Eye were considering Mirio, but like they haven't explicitly, I don't think, you know, talked or explored the possibility. And I don't think it's just a possibility. I think it probably definitely happened before of what happens when one for all is passed on to someone who has a quirk, you know, like, it, like it, how it, how it interfaces with that. Like if it, do you get multiple abilities? And I mean, what, what I think is, go, was is eventually going to happen. I mean, I'm curious what you guys think about this theory is that, the uh and maybe it's not so much maybe it has been mentioned in the series i just totally forget but that like that a bunch of the successors because we know all might when before he got all for one didn't have a quirk but we don't know about the, mm-hmm. the successors before him and i presuming that we'll find out that they did have quirks and midoriya can access those abilities through all for one or one yeah quirk. i think the original uh one for all didn't have a quirk originally, but then all for one gave him the one for all quirk. So right. Right. yeah, I yeah, think the right. I think uh, since all for one's brother was originally quirkless, maybe all his uh, successors were also quirkless, and they were bestowed, you know, a quirk, you know, and just that's just been passed on between quirkless uh, individuals all this time. It doesn't seem like All Might had that as a condition, though, because if they were considering Mario, they they clearly weren't only considering quirkless people. So mm-hmm. that's true. And maybe what happens is that the one for all quirk replaces the host's existing quirk. Hmm. Yeah, it's also possible, especially if it's like on the theme of like giving up your power for the greater good or something. That could totally fit in. But on the subject of giving up quirks and what quirks you'd prefer. Uh, the next question is, if you could pick any quirk from the series thus far to have as your own, which would you pick and why? My choice would probably be Yao Yorozu's power to make uh, a bunch of things from her body fat and whatever, because, like, you know, first of all, I could easily lose weight by just making a bunch of things. And the second of all, it'd be pretty convenient to make just whatever I could imagine just on the fly like that, just using my own body material. So, yeah, that's a, I think that's a pretty useful quirk. Hmm. What quirk would I want to have? Um, I'd probably say maybe the jet engine legs. He does. Mm-hmm. He does. It, just mainly for traveling sake. Yeah, it would be pretty useful. Oh, but pants. Pants would be so hard to get, though. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> You can just wear shorts. Yeah, yeah, you'd, yeah have, wear- you'd have to wear shorts for the rest of your life. 
<laughs> like it'll be really, it'll be really tough during the winter time. But like, oh boy, yeah. Well, well, well I'm sure the <laughs> engines in your legs will keep 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 your legs warm. Yeah, yeah, Maybe. that's true. Yeah. Jeff, what what about your answer? Because I I feel like I have an answer, but I feel like you're gonna pick it first. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Todoroki would be the coolest to like. It wouldn't be practical in daily life though. It's like okay, well, that's it's an overpowered ability, but like mm. I, I don't want to go fighting things. So yeah, I think it would definitely be Jiro for the headphones. Yeah, that's and, what I thought. <laughs> and and what, what I didn't realize recently, I, I saw a uh, a screenshot of a panel recently. And I I never noticed this that I think she has the ability to just like control like she doesn't need to like carry like they move freely like they, there are appendages that can like they show her um opening a door with with the headphone cable and i'm like wait so it's basically like kind of like two extra arms and they can plug into things to listen to stuff all like i don't need to carry on headphones like oh my god that, that'd be perfect like headphones that you can control completely with your mind like mm, it's, it's even better than bluetooth i was i was gonna pick that but i figured no nah, i'll let jeff have that one um <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> Oh man, I don't know. I don't know what I would want. I can't really think of what quirk would be very useful for me personally. Um, I, <laughs> I, I want to say I want the invisibility quirk, but I don't want people to get the wrong idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> uh, I, I just, I just think it'd be funny to have it so I could, like, you know, because so, sometimes I like to. Me and my friends have this constant thing where, like, my friends are a lot better at spooking me than I'm at spooking them. And every time I spook them, I'm, I'm like, always too super fucking obvious about it. And they see me coming from a mile away. So I, I would I would want invisibility for stealth. I promise. Just stealth. For the right just reasons. Just spook your friends. Yes, just to spook my friends. And nothing else. <laughs> I, I, I think the only thing we haven't really uh, wondered about is, like, can, can she turn that off? I don't know. That That's really. There's... I don't know. We haven't seen her not invisible ever. So. Maybe you can't turn it off. Yeah, if you can't turn it off, that seems like much more of a curse than a blessing. No, yeah, th- then that would be terrible. <laughs> well, uh, assuming that you could turn it off, I I think invisibility would be useful. I wonder. I kind of wonder, like the person, the like the anime staff who had to like design her, char- like do the character design. Like, oh, this is an easy one. <laughs> they're pro- yeah, yeah, they were probably like, man, we got a lot of work ahead of us. I, I don't know how we're going to animate this. <laughs> yeah. You know, invisibility is always a very useful power. Yeah. But if you can't turn on visible when you need to, hmm, it yeah. might be kind of a double-edged sword right there. Yeah. I spooked, it, one time in college, I, like, we would do that, like, trying to spook each other and i had this friend one of my roommates who had like a i guess i guess chronic illness is the term it's not like a not like a deadly or anything but like a illness that you know like he was realizing he had at the time and so I, I basically hid under his bed and then and he was like he's really susceptible to surprises and being scared i oh, hid under no. his bed and then like just reached out after he like sat in his bed and he like <laughs> it was like it was the it was a huge it, he was super freaked out and then was like totally fine, but then like the next week went to the hospital, and I was like, oh no, what did I do? What did I do? <laughs> it was to- totally unrelated, <laughs> but like I was like, oh no. I was expecting that story to take a really like hard turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it felt like though. <laughs> okay, so I guess if we're all settled with that question, the next question we've already used for the manga fight, so I think we'll go on to Insatsuken's final question, which is. In the spirit of superheroes and crossovers, being that Horikoshi clearly takes a lot of influence from American comic books, what Western superhero would it be most fun to see interact with the characters of the MHJ universe? Oh, jeez. Um... I think Spider-Man and Midoriya is pretty obvious, uh, you know, pairing. They're pretty similar characters. Their story arcs are kind of very similar. Only difference is that I would say that uh, Midoriya isn't nearly as cocky. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I want Peter Parker to teach uh to teach Bidoria how to how to give good one liners. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah, he could teach he could teach Midoriya to kinda of lighten up a little bit, crack a joke every once in a while. That that would be a good story arc. Like you need you need to be able to do this in order to be an inspirational hero, so I'm gonna just yeah. send you to a joke training school in America. And... <laughs> <laughs> oh man, maybe that will be an arc <laughs> in the series at some point. Like Midoriya has to train under Ms. Joke and learn the <laughs> art and learn how to have a sense of humor. Yeah, to teach teach Midoriya how to not act so nerdy all the time. That'd be interesting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, there's there's a lot you could do with this one. Yeah. yeah. Horikoshi Sensei has like talked about like really liking Spider Man before, right? I'm making it yeah. Up. I feel like I... Yeah, Spider Man's his favorite superhero. Ah, right, right. I'm sure he's mentioned that in um I think in like the recent uh Viz Shonen Jump interview that I think that was in like a month or two ago at this point. Oh man, I don't know. It's some it's maybe like the Flash. It'd be interesting because I don't think they've really encountered many speedsters. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. actually that's interesting. Out of all the quirks you could have, I'm surprised we haven't run into something like that yet. Yeah, it's weird how fish. like Ida is so. It's like oh, he kind of has speed, but not really. Gran Torino is kind of close, but mm-hmm. even that is just like he's jumping around pretty fast. That's about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole concept is. Beatsters. I mean, the only, the only like uh, you know things I've really consumed are the Flash TV series, the first two seasons of it. But it's like yeah. it's it's such a um, not overpowered, but like it, it's such a like almost limitless power. And I feel yeah. like yeah. in order to like keep that in check in things like Flash, they have to um, you know dumb them down and like they they can't think of everything. They're not they're not actually that smart. Or the writing doesn't really think about all those different possibilities. And I feel like yeah, I feel like the reason you know, in designing characters like Ida and giving them a speed ability, but not an actual, like, you know, can actually just move faster in every way. It was, it was to limit it so that he wouldn't be completely overpowered. Cause if there were someone like Ida in the class who just had super speed, it'd be like, well, you can solve everything if you're creative. Yeah. And I feel like he's, he's pretty good about like being creative, but maybe it's someone who's like a, I don't know, there's a restriction and there's a reason they can't. Cause he's pretty, also pretty good about like, when introducing a really powerful ability, giving some restriction yeah. to prevent that from being, you know, as overpowered. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much interaction you get out get out of this one, but it's a pretty superficial one. But maybe Kirishima and Tetsu 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 can uh, can team up with Luke Cage or something because you know all their all their skins are hard. There you go. Yeah, a black person <laughs> in Japan. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I had another one too. It would it would be interesting because I like the, I guess it's not really so much a recent development anymore because it happened a little while ago. But I, I kind of like with the development in mind of Midoriya thinking, oh maybe I, maybe I should try kicking things instead of punching things. I it'd be interesting for him to like maybe learn a martial art. So maybe like hmm. maybe maybe a team up with like Danny Rand and uh, and Midoriya would be kind of interesting. He can't use his fists. <laughs> yeah. Well, he could still he could still like. He could still teach him some kind of martial arts. Iron foot. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't sound as cool, but we'll, we'll take it. Yeah. Yeah. How well, about Howard the Duck? Just for no reason. <laughs> oh, that'd be fun. <laughs> just like, yeah, just just have Howard the Duck be like a teacher at at, at a UA. That'd be interesting. It makes sense. Yeah. I mean, the principal's already a mouse. Yeah, and there's already a a, a dog police chief. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to know the rest of that guy's story. How yeah. did he get here, looking like a dog? <laughs> that that guy needs it. That guy needs his own series, honestly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think it'd be cool if they like uh, did a, like, a really heavy promotional campaign for like months or something. Like, we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna be a time with a DC a, a huge DC character. Like get get excited! It's gonna be it's gonna be a huge reveal, and then it's like Aquaman or something. And <laughs> <laughs> oh dang! Uh, it look they're ever in the ocean. Yeah, but that would be a good change of uh, place then, you know, to have an arc by the ocean or a story like in the, uh, by the sea or something. And Gangorka can uh, be involved then too. <laughs> it would be pretty neat. One final idea I have is like, I really think it'd be cool if there was a character like the question in MHA. So I'm like just oh, thinking yeah. about, mm. a, uh, about a crossover where like, the question teams up with Sir Night Eye to like investigate the Yakuza groups and like you know uncover like the mystery of what they're doing and stuff. That could be like a neat kind of different kind of character and story to cross over with the MJ verse. I don't know if you'd really get a lot out of this one, but not not. I just this this is more like a like a fan art idea of anything. But I I kind of want to see um I kind of want to see Momo just like. Uh, just providing her all her props, I think that'd be a, that'd be that'd be a funny like little fan art idea. Yeah, that'd be that'd be cute. I think again, I I I, I know you probably wouldn't get like too much out of that other than that one fan art idea, but I just thought hey, that'd be kind of cute. <laughs> if if if, yeah. I, if I saw that on my Twitter timeline, I'd be like, okay, this this gets a like. <laughs> I, I would actually um to go around that and actually throw out like a villain to be showing up in here, like someone like the Riddler. 
I would like to see. Yeah. Like to see in this universe. Not not a calendar man? No. I feel like, <laughs> but like, oh, Lord, like a, a more of a modern Riddler, like he who is a lot more uh, the more intellectual type uh kind of guy. Yeah. Who, yeah. That would actually be a little more interesting. Uh, that would be kind of cool. A, he's a regular dude, so imagine that. I think that's like if there is anything that I would like to see more of in something like My Hero Academia is having regular ass dudes be huge villains. Because they don't, they only ever deal with like like super villains, like anyone with powers and stuff. They never actually dealt with just a regular guy. Might be deranged or whatever, but yeah, I would imagine someone like that to be in this world, just as like, a, oh wow, who would have thought? Yeah, that that would be interesting. Yeah. I know you said Calendar Man in Jess, Colton, but if it was, like, the Calendar Man from Long Halloween and, like, Dark Victory, where he's kind of like a Hannibal Lecter-esque character, then, you know, maybe that would be kind of... Wait, that exists? Kind of interesting. Oh, yeah, that there's there's very dark versions of Calendar Man. I'll have to look those You'd up later. You'd be surprised, Colton. <laughs> he's not Condiment, Condiment King or something like that, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I think that does it with Insatsu Qu- Ken's questions, so we'll move on to questions from Spark of Spirit. First one is, quirk free for all between all year one students, who wins? Hmm. I feel like just on sheer tenacity alone, somehow Bakugo would win. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I was about to say. I think a hilarious answer would be, like, if Mimeta just stuck everyone to the ground with his balls <laughs> and then just walked away, so he kind of basically wins. Mimeta would be the kind of person who just, like, like hide in the corner and wait for everybody to beat up on each other, and then just be like, well, oh, oh, look at that, I, I win! Well, if that's the case, then Invisible Girl would probably be the the real winner. Oh, yeah, that's true, because everyone would forget about her because she's invisible. Yeah, I, f- I feel like Todoroki, though, could just, like, freeze every- like the entire arena, and so, like, yeah. she wouldn't really... Actually, wait, that would... If if he freezes her, wouldn't we get to see her body? That would be... That'd be kind of weird. Huh. At the very least, the outline of her body. Yeah, I'm not sure what happens when you uh, when ice freezes. Maybe it's still... St- or, or not, when invisible things freeze. It probably would still be invisible. You would at least have, like, a mold or something within the ice. But, uh... Yeah, there are a lot of characters here that could easily win this, I think, actually, now that I think about that. Because, yeah, you could easily, like Jeff said, you could just easily have Todoroki just freeze everybody and eat you win. It's hard, it's hard to really fight, like, just a very overpowered ability, so, like, even if you were to be a creative... I feel like Midoriya probably wouldn't win. No. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Yeah, he'd wear himself out too easily. Yeah, he'd, he'd put up a good fight, but, you know, eventually, like, he still kind of has his limits. Yeah. But on the other hand, in terms of, like, Todoroki being overpowered or people having overpowered abilities, I mean, I think there's enough flexibility that it's like, yeah, he has one of the strongest abilities in terms of, like, raw area of effect and everything. But, like, if it, I feel like if there were a scenario like this in, in the actual storyline, I don't think there's a clear answer. I mean, like, if you throw them in an arena and, like, go start, I'm sure, like, you know, half of them could come up with, like, in that moment, a counter to, to being frozen. I mean, like, mm-hmm. Bakugo could, you know, like, fire, you know, like, explode enough that it you know, repels the ice. I mean, they could... I think there are all sorts of different things that... I, I could see if they're actually in the storyline, there being so many different possibilities. Except for right. except for Midoriya, because he probably wouldn't. I mean, I, I, can, yeah. I can't think of anyone else who would, like, really easily win. Maybe Momo could, like, make a giant tent and, and protect herself? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe. I mean, she's able to make a cannon. She could probably make a pretty protective, like, safe bunker thing. Probably. But even then, I feel like she probably she has, she has a limit on her powers, right? Yeah, I mean, she makes it out of her like body fat, so she can only like do so much because she can only burn so many calories. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, I can't think any more like easy answers. Yeah, I mean, Ari <laughs> is. I would I would think he's just like a one shot and he's done. He's yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. Like if he takes out everyone at once, maybe, but. I don't know if he can really... Uh, J- Jiro could jab everybody in the eye if she wanted the fight dirty, I guess? <laughs> I mean, she she can project sound waves, so there, there's yeah. Just that. Yeah, I mean, she could uh, probably deafen everyone. Oh, that'd be terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Tokoyami? I think he can... He can his... I mean, assuming there is, like, in a dark area... Yeah, let's make sure that room isn't dark. Yeah. Because otherwise he probably wins. <laughs> yeah, in terms of, like, you know, if it were in some kind of, like 
take down everyone because I feel like in a lot of the situations we've seen, it's like them on a team or they have to be considerate of. I think that's a lot of Kaminari's restrictions is that, oh, if he attacks, it'll destroy everyone else. And but like I think Toyami, if they were just like, no, you don't need to be concerned with anyone else, he could just you know like aim to take the out whatever lights are in the area, and then mm-hmm. overpower everyone. Maybe. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Do we have any more ideas? Or I don't. I don't have anything, unfortunately. I, that 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 is a tough one. And there's even a few that are just like I don't know. Aoyama, he has a, he has a getter beam. Like that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I guess we'll move on to the next question. Would a crossover between One Punch Man and My Hero Academia work well? And I think definitely, uh, I'd love to see a crossover between those two series. And, well, you know, one idea that I keep thinking about that, like, I really kind of want to see is a crossover where Stain and Garo meet. Because they're both Mm. hero killers. Mm. They both, like, hate heroes. But the thing with Garo is, is that, like, his character arc is, like, deep down... He still ha he has humanity in him and that, you know, makes him feel kind of disgusted with himself, but he also can't, he has his own sense of honor code that, you know, he ha, he feels compelled to abide by, like when he protected, uh, Metal Bat and his sister from monsters that were going to attack them. Yeah. And so, you know, Garo, and like the difference with Stain is that Stain is like completely far gone. Like he thinks like what he's doing is the right thing. He thinks he's, he's like the, like ultimate crusader and like all his murders are for right. So like there's this dichotomy of intentions there. Like Stain thinks that he's, ki- he's killing heroes for the greater good. And then, uh, Garo is doing, is like fighting and defeating heroes because he wants to be the ultimate monster and the greatest evil. But in contrast, Garo is a better person than Stain. So, you know, there's just so much you could do with those characters clashing off against each other. And I, I really want to, you know, I know it's probably not going to happen, but it's like, <laughs> man, it, it, it's that that story would be something that I'd really like to see, you know, be written and be, like, drawn as a crossover. I, I agree. I, I think... I think that story would be really interesting, and I think I think it would present an opportunity to get a lot out of both characters. But you know, mm-hmm. um, at the end of the day, I think what we all want to see is a fight against Midoriya and Saitama. Who would win, guys? Well, yes, of course, he's he Saitama. Would win. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but but no, but no, guys. I I I did all the math. I have my calculator here, and, and I did all the math. And if if you remove the two, Midoriya has like a point two percent chance. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna send it in. T- I'm gonna send this uh, idea into Screw Attack, and uh, I'm gonna have him confirm. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Uh, that honestly, that's that's probably that's probably the most. Uh, joking aside, um, Sid's idea is probably the most probably the most interesting idea. I I I think I think it'd be interesting overall to see a crossover between the two series, and like, and maybe. You could somehow fit the the hero association in there, or some or something, and because because I I think it, it would be interesting to see these like some some heroes from like uh, from the One Punch Man universe just uh, come in contact with these with these people that like actually have superpowers that are like born with them and be like oh shit real heroes do exist. I, I would like to see the Midoriya Moomin Rider interaction. <laughs> oh yeah, those would be great characters to work off with one another. Midoriya would idolize him so much. So, somehow, <laughs> I feel like. Moomin Rider is a real hero we deserve. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but Moomin Rider is also um, an, an All Might fanboy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Jeff, do you have any particular ideas or opinions? Uh, I, mean, I, don't, I don't have any ideas on, like, on, on serious uh, like story-based crossovers but i think there's like tons of potential there for for gag stuff i mean just like mm-hmm. i mean any interactions between midoriya and saitama would has has tons of potential for for gags and pretty humorous stuff in terms of like would it ever work in terms of well i don't know i i guess the way this, this typically works in manga like this is that they're like one-off chapters that aren't don't really tie into the actual storyline so Mm. that's my understanding at least mm-hmm. and you guys probably have more experience with that though yeah crossovers are usually like they're just fun they don't really like they don't have any real bearing on anything other than oh what would it be like to see these characters interact <laughs> yeah and I think, I think i think that could be like you could have a bunch of different pairings i mean midoriya and saitama would be cool to like you know see them 
I don't know, just like see Midoriya, have Midoriya see Saitama and idolize him. Or like, I think it'd be cool to have Bakugo's like taken off his high horse by trying to go against Saitama and just being like, wow, this was, he didn't even do anything. And <laughs> I already lost. <laughs> <laughs> actually, that would be, uh, I, I was joking earlier, but it actually would be kind of interesting to have Midoriya interact with Saitama because Midoriya, because My Hero Academia overall is a more optimistic superhero story, whereas One Punch Man, I think for the most part, is kind of cynical in the sense of where, you know, Saitama at one point had a real drive to be a superhero, and now that he finally has all the power he ever wanted, you know, he kind of feels empty and whatnot, and that's, you know, that's kind of his character arc. So I feel like it would be interesting to have someone a little, to to basically have Midoriya, someone who's a little more a little more positive and outgoing uh, team up with Saitama, who's basically kind of been through it all and, uh, and kind of knows what it's like to be an actual superhero and just have him be like, Hey kid, it's, it's, it's not that great. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be interesting to see if Midoriya's enthusiasm could overcome Saitama's jadedism or jaded you Cynicism? Know, uh, personality. Cynicism. Well, he's jaded, but yeah, so he's, I don't know if Saitama himself is, I mean, he's somewhat cynical, but Saikama is also still, you know, a good person. And he, like, he, yeah, he will like go out of his way, you know, to help people. He's mostly just bored. Not really. He's not like. <laughs> yeah, he's he's mostly just bored. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That would be. He just a... wants a ch- he wants a challenge. That's like his real thing. There, yeah, there would be so many generational undertones to that too. Having like a this like young high school kid like yay, and this uh, you know like twenty something year old is just like life sucks, kid. <laughs> 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 I, I think that that would probably be the most um, interesting interaction. The more I think about it, man, why doesn't this exist? I feel like this. I feel like <laughs> I feel like this. This this could be something that like this is something that Shuei should should really get on somehow. Yeah, it seems. Yeah, like hopefully with time they'll make it. Hopefully, M- maybe uh, maybe when the next season of the One Punch Man anime comes out. Yeah, that'd be great. But Ooh, maybe they're both made by Bones, are they? No, 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 yeah. One Punch Man was Madhouse, yeah. so I don't know. But yeah. maybe they could make something work, because Bones did Mob Psycho, so who knows? I was going to say, I think, I don't want to speak like I, I, I know something, but if I understand correctly, I know there were a lot, I think they outsourced a lot of um, animation on uh, for One Punch Man in particular to a, to a lot of different people, and, not, and I don't think they just stuck to madhouse people i think they got a whole bunch of people to come in and animate for that show so maybe they got some bones people at some point i don't know yeah but that's a little different like uh the studio rights conflict is a little different than like uh the specific people that are you know worked on the show that's fair uh again i, I don't I'm, I'm not saying i I know i know for sure but it's just from no yeah. uh, it is true well there were a lot of bones animators worked on one punch man because uh, the director called in just basically, like, all the most talented animators in the industry pretty much to work on the show. So, yeah. you know, you're right. It's just that, you know, to make a... Just that the fact that the same people worked on the show is... It doesn't overcome, like, the limitations of, like, who has the rights to make what show and stuff. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, if it were a crossover, that would probably be in manga form, I'm betting. Anyway, yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, like... You know, I'm I, I'm pretty sure they've had like a like chapter of One Punch Man in like Shonen Jump before as like a preview, like in the Japanese Shonen Jump. I think at one point that happened. So I don't know. Like you, you could you could have that run in Shonen Jump. I think you could easily do that. Yeah, and at the same time, you never know. They could make a crossover work, even if it even if the anime anime have different studios. Like uh, the Sket Dancing and Tama pulled off the crossover, and they had different studios. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Okay, so I guess we'll move on to the next question. Would a time skip work in a series like this? And I think that yeah, I think a time skip will probably happen. Honestly, yeah. you know, that's just kind of thing to expect with Shonen series at this point. And I think that you know, just in general, since Horikoshi is a really skilled writer, that it will work. So I'm not too concerned about that. I'm curious though, like I mean, it's a pretty, pretty common staple in shonen anime to have or shonen manga to have time skips. Is it that common for shonen manga set in school? 
Yeah, I mean, like, I guess if you think about series like Bleach, where the characters are high school students, you know, you don't get, oh, like, yeah. a time skip. I mean, you did, Bleach had a time skip, but, like, it was a short time and skip. And it was also, like, it, their, their school life didn't really matter that much for the show. Yeah, it didn't. <laughs> for the series. Yeah. But when My Hero Academia, I'd be thinking that the time skip would happen, like, after like uh, maybe sometime after they've graduated school and like a little bit after they've started their professional career, maybe a year gap between when they left school and uh, started, you know, their career. Do, do we have a sense? So, do we know what time of year it is in the current manga storyline? Well, they're still in their first yeah, year. Yeah, it's on the first year. But... Uh, I think they're in, they're in their second semester. So it'd be like in the fall. Yeah, because cause I guess the... the... This, the training camp where Bakugo got kidnapped was summer camp, right? Yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, it was during yeah. summer, at least not not actual summer camp, but yeah. So yeah, I guess they're still still pretty early in the year. Like if it if the year you know, like the school year starts in April, which is when the show started or series started, that like and I guess there was technically a time skip actually because we start a year before. There already was one. Oh, that's true. <laughs> there already was one. Yeah, that's our answer right there. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I guess if. No, go on, Doctor. Uh, no, I was gonna say, like, most of the time, they've, they've, they've been kind of, they do, like, a lot of stealth little time skips. It's like, and some months happened, and then they go to the next thing. Yeah. So, it, it's sort of, it's always kind of there, but, like, having a, if you were to complete a year and, like, have all of the essential lessons that you need for a, to be a superhero be in within that year and then the rest of the years are just like reinforcement of that those ideals then i could see something like uh then we skip to like either graduation or um some t- or like or just the last year of school something like that I- enough to enough of a jump that you can final exams make sense and you know everyone getting into their appropriate superhero uh like or agent um, agencies or whatever um so it, it's somewhere there. I, I I would like to see something like that. I, I think I've always talked about having something like, like having that sort of jump into like, okay, now Deku is a full fledged superhero. Let's see what he does. But uh, we're not there yet, so eh, no, yeah, it it would it benefit the series to having having one somewhere. Yeah, it's gonna happen eventually, but it it, it would help. Yeah, and I, th- I think like there's pretend like I think like the reservation to like time skip them out of high school. You know, like, w- would they still connect with the readers to, to a younger audience? But I think because they're all super powered and, you know, like, I think, you know, like, that there's not really much of a concern with that. Like, if they're working in hero agencies, it can be more about the super powered fights than about the, like, you know, daily life of working at a job. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if this is actually going to happen, how the series is actually going to end. But I think a, a neat way for it to end would be for it to be Deku finding his successor. You know, if it's actually, like, training them, probably not, but more like, you know, in the last couple of pages, there's an obvious candidate, and it's like, okay, you, you can kind of pick up where it goes from there. So I think for that to happen, there has to be some kind of time skip, but I mean, you know, that, that could be like in the last chapter epilogue kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we're all in agreement that a time skip probably would be good for the series. So I guess moving on, uh, the next question is, if Todoroki and Bakugo had fought for real in the sports festival, who would have won? I think... Todoroki would have won because it, I think he was more skilled than Bakugo and, and, you know, would have fought more efficiently, but he just had no motivation in the fight at that point. So, you know, that's why, you know, he kind of let Bakugo win because he just didn't care at that point. But if Todoroki was actually motivated, I think he could have beaten Bakugo. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Uh, are we all in agreement on that? Or do you have anything more to say? Uh, I got really much else to say. I think that, that, like, having, I think, Todoroki needing that sort of revelation of himself and using both abilities, I think that was, it, if just being able to do that would be enough to be like, yeah, this guy's going to win easily. Yeah. But... And I think there's also, like, like at, at the time, maybe, maybe not, because he's still, I, I think there's more potential for him to, like, over time learn how to use the two abilities to their you know, strategically and everything, and if he, and if he at that point was like, I'm never going to use this fire ability com- combatively, then like, mm. yeah, he, he's much more limited. But like, if it's like now in the series, my, many more options, and like, he should, I think he should probably beat Bakugo one on one. Okay, so I guess the final question from Spark of Spirit is which color page is the greatest? And this is hard because there's a lot of really great ones. Oh, I would have to look at them. Uh, I mean, like the I, some of the most iconic to me are like. Uh, the color page from like chapter 27 or something where it's like all the students, you know, kind of in a group shot and they're like, uh, running forward or something. And like, there's this 
horse in the background, which was weird, but... <laughs> yeah, the horse, I was like, what? The, the horse is kind of weird, but I think it's there because... Because I'm pretty sure the series was in the uh, the sports festival. Yeah, it was during the Calvary battle. So, so, so the imagery I think makes sense when you when you think about it from that angle. But other, uh, but otherwise, yeah. without that context, it's like, what's that horse doing here? <laughs> yeah, what does that symbolize? Another great one is, of course, the heroes versus villains uh, one. You know, where it has the villains on one side and the heroes on the other side, and there's like this big horses in the middle. That's a great one. That's a good one. I yeah. really love uh, a color page from like chapter ninety three. It was towards the end of the All Might versus All for One battle, where it's like uh, Deku and All Might like just sitting on a bench in a park. There's just something like really poignant about that image that I just really liked. Yeah, though I think those are my the three ones that really stick out to me. I I in general just really like Horikoshi's colored works in general. And, uh, as, as much as I like his, his, um, his color pages, like his, his two page color spreads or whatever, um, there are some really good ones, but I can't think of any, like, off the top of my head that, like, really stood out to me that I think, oh, yeah, like, this is, this is, like, amazing. I love this. I think just one of my general favorite colored works of his is, um, is the art from, uh, I forget which issue of Jump it is, but uh, the art that he did for for the cover of Jump uh, from the issue of Jump, where I think they announced the first season of the My Hero Academia anime, where it's just uh, Midoriya doing like the superhero pose with the fist on the ground and him making a crater in the ground and whatnot. I I really like that promotional image. It's probably my favorite out of at least all of the manga promotional stuff. Um, I just think it looks cool. I I, th- I like I made that one my Twitter banner for a while. <laughs> oh, and I'd be remiss to mention uh, one more, like the and it, the image of like Bakugo, who's uh, like during the sports festival. It's like ch- for chapter forty five, and he's like standing over like this mound of dirt or whatever in the middle of the sports festival field, you know. And he's just like roaring, and he's like, Rah! you know, it's like that image was like really great. And what's memorable about that image to me is just that that chapter came out back when I was uh, doing like weekly Shonen Jump reviews. So like after I reviewed like that chapter, like I remember getting a comment from our very own Spark of Spirit here, who is like, man, that like color page is crazy. Awesome. And then after that, he was like, okay, I'm going to, ch- I got to check out my hero academia. It looks pretty awesome. <laughs> and so he did, de- he did. And then it became, it's become like his favorite series ever. So it's like, you know, that, that's memorable to me because like, I remember it was around that time that Spark decided like he was going to read M- MHA and now he loves MHA a lot. So I'd be, I'd be remiss not to mention uh, that color page. Do, do you guys have any that uh, come to mind at all? I, I'm I, I've been like googling a bunch of spreads to see which one <laughs> isn't. Um, I like them in street clothes. It's so different. Yeah, mm. that one's pretty good. It, it's not not as like it's not flashy or anything, but it's just funny to see them. Like, oh yeah, that's right. Like they're kids. They should actually have real clothes. Yeah, it, like I I, yeah. I like I like that concept in in shonen manga sometimes because um, Dragon Ball kind of does that every once in a while too, where it's like you know. You see them wearing like just normal people clothes, and it's like, oh wait, oh wait, they they like sometimes they have normal lives. What about you, Jeff? Uh, I really like the the spread for the is it the first? I'm not sure if it's the first. I think it was the first character pull, no, the second character pull, because it's the one where Baku goes first place, and like I, you can just explain it to some like I was like watching the anime with my girlfriend, and we're you know like not even like she's just starting to appreciate Baku, and I'm like, oh yeah, I can explain how he won the. The character pull and how so the page, the spread is just him screaming about being first place and it's a great great little story there. Actually, the one with um, I think this one's an early one. I don't remember which chapter this is from, but one I think one of Horikoshi's like really early color spreads is the one where Bakugo makes an explosion and everybody's like jumping from it or whatever. Um, I'm sure some of you've probably seen that around a lot. I really, I really like that one too. That's a really good early one of his. And I like, I like looking at it. Like I never noticed looking at it. Like right now, I never noticed. Like it should have clicked with me that Bakugo is the one that causes the explosion. I, I, I I'm, I'm like looking at him right now. He, there, there he is. There, he's right behind all the explosions and stuff. Oh, huh. I ne- yeah, I never connected that. I never saw him in the background. It's like, huh? That that really, it's like it's like well, duh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, Horikoshi's colored works are always great in general, though. Yeah, I really love all of them. Um, I guess that that's it for questions from Sparky Spirit, so we'll move on from our final animation revelation question from Gunsword Fist, who asks, where does Deku rank among your favorite superheroes? Hmm. Favorite superheroes? Mm. That, that's a, that's a lot. Unfortunately, I don't. I mean, I mean, no, I want to rank him high. I would rank him. I don't even know if if we were to do, do like a top ten list, he'd probably be in an honorable mention section. Maybe. I think that's where I'd put him too. You know, if I were to compare superheroes. Yeah, as a superhero, I don't know if I don't know if he'd be on my list. If if it came to, I don't even know if I have a list of favorite superheroes. Honestly, how about you, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, I I don't like consume that much superhero fiction and stuff, so like, I don't have much of a listing. But I think he he um Deku in the, I'm gonna tie this back to Digimon. Um, De- De- Deku is uh very similar to the main character of Digimon season three, Digimon Tamers, um Takato, who is like you know this nerd who like likes. I mean, in the season in the world of Digimon Tamers, it's like Digimon is a fictional property, and he's so obsessed with it, he, he like you know draws a Digimon that Digimon becomes real, and then he like gets to live out his Digimon adventure. Um, but like there are a lot, and they're, they're reserved, take lots of notes. There are a lot of similarities. And like, I think that makes when like thinking about Digimon characters, I'm always like, okay, Takato is interesting on paper. And there are a lot of like interesting things to think about, about him, but like never really ranks high in my favorite characters, which I think like that's pretty similar with, with uh, Deku and other, other like manga characters. It's like, yeah, he's, um, a lot of interesting stuff going on. I'm curious to see his journey, and I'm, I'm sure there's lots of potential by the time the story's over for there to be developments that uh, make him highly ranked superhero or favorite character or anything. But like for now, it's like, eh, he's he's interesting, but not really favorite. Mm-hmm. But even if he's not one of our favorite superheroes, I think we can all agree that he is relatable. Yeah. 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 yeah that, that's yeah. that's that's one of the reasons why I I like I really gravitated towards My Hero Academia is that. You know, I felt like I really related to Midoriya compared to, again, other shonen protagonists. I don't know, to me, he felt like a person. Like, he, he felt like a person I would probably actually run into and meet in my everyday life. Mm-hmm. But I think that does it for questions from Animation Revelation, so we'll move on to our Reddit questions. First up, we got some questions from Kenny Pierales. We already used his what makes a good hero, what makes a good villain questions for our manga fight. So, moving past those... He asks, was Mirio Togata a better successor candidate than Deku? And my answer to this is, I don't know about that. Because we, we, I mean, I think that Mirio, in terms of his character, is very much like Deku and is very, like, admirable. So he, it would have been a wordy candidate, but a better candidate than Deku. I think that, you know, as we see more of the two of them working together... I think the series will affirm that Deku was the best choice all along for some reason, but we just haven't seen enough of uh, Mirio in action to really be able to determine like what he does better than Deku and what Deku does better than him. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally think they're they're both good. Yeah, they're they're both good, and like I mean, the thing that kind of that I keep thinking about is like we still don't know the mechanics of how one for all would have worked if it had been passed down to someone with a quirk. And without that, it's hard to, to tell. Because if, if it would have been, like, you know, he got both powers, and it's kind of hard to be, like, like that, that, that would have made him, like, really extre- extremely powerful, right? Like, I would have... It's it's hard to argue that Deku would be a better candidate than just in terms of power. You have to kind of ignore power and be, like, okay, well, based on character-wise, like, whatever. I was going to say, um, maybe this has been explained, and I and I probably just forgot or missed it, but for all we know... And correct me if I'm wrong, but you know maybe maybe quirks work the same way that like devil fruits and one piece do, where like you can't really have more than one at a time. Maybe that'd be fun. They, people explode. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, I, f- I feel like I still have to spend more time with Nerio. I, I think it's th- there's that little thing in the back of my neck that I feel like I don't know. I still don't, I don't trust this guy for some dumb reason. I, but he's too good to be true. Is, uh, see, is, see, I I can see I, that. I had- I had that feeling to the nth degree when we first met All Might. Like I was, like especially because he he's, he has a secret, whatever. So he's acting kind of shady, and so like I was like, okay, the point of the series is that he's going to meet his hero and then be disappointed, and then be like, wow, my hero really wasn't that good after all. And like that that's really not what the thing. Is. I think I went into it with like the weird a weird expectation of that. 
So that's why I kind of don't want that to be the, the case with Mirio, because I feel like the series is kind of, um, it's not the angle it goes for, and it's it's a bit too cynical. But like, yeah. well, yeah. Well, well, you know, to to your point, Jeff, we we don't we don't know, you know, All Might has really proven himself, <laughs> but you know, we, we can, but but like we can, he, I'm I'm sure that one day he'll have a Hail Hydra moment. We'll see. It can happen. Yeah. <laughs> he, he he will be secret Nazi, and um and but guys, don't worry, just wait, wait until the end of the story. It might <laughs> the man actually pay off. <laughs> Ooh, comics are fun. Yeah. I think moving on, the next question is who is the better mentor, All for One or All Might to their successor? Uh, I think clearly All Might is a more responsible and, uh, yeah. you know, nurturing mentor than uh, All for One. Yeah. I'm not agreeing there. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure All for One means well. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he believes Shigaraki can become the next big villain, I'm sure, but uh, uh, he just he certainly doesn't uh, care necessarily about yeah, him. He's using negative reinforcement to make his... It's just, just like Endeavor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and th- there's some there's some stuff there about how, uh, like, I, I mean, it's mostly to obscure his identity, but one for all. Every time I say those things, I have to think about it. One for yeah. all. Wait, no. Well, all, for, all for one. All for one. Yeah. All, for, all for one. It's uh, okay. I get, I, get, I get confused, too. <laughs> it, it's really confusing but um he like you know doesn't interact with shigaraki directly using a computer monitor for for much of the series and stuff so like like and, and whereas all might is like you know in deku's face literally and so they're just so much more uh personable and i don't know there's something they're kind of a little jab at like online communication not really being as <laughs> uh personal yeah. but whatever <laughs> M- maybe mm-hmm. this podcast is uh we're more like wall for one because we're not in person mm. <laughs> oh man so we're villains huh yeah i guess so oh maybe. that sucks Let, let's, oh, go. Boy. let's go get rid of the heroes but should we side with the yakuza or with the league of villains does this mean that everybody who has a podcast is a villain then <laughs> I guess so. I guess there's a lot of villains out there in the I, I I guess me and doc would probably be the biggest offenders then <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that'd be an interesting story that like somehow podcasts are destroying the world and number of people yeah you know, p- p- people, pe- here. that would be p- a fun p- people, story sp- people spend too much time in front of a screen nothing's personable anymore <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But I guess social commentary aside <laughs> yeah sorry yeah so instead of talking about villains let's talk about uh heroism and the next question is who had the better ideas for creating a symbol of peace all might or sir night eye specifically regarding like who they thought would be the better successor so it's kind of similar to a the question like we kind of answered before but it's like i mean sir night eye has a more like objective rationalist approach but i think all might saw something in deku that you know goes beyond that like he saw the potential and he saw the heart of a true hero in him that could become like the next great hero and symbol of peace mm-hmm. so i think all might have the right idea there yeah i think comparing them all might definitely have the, the better idea of the two but i still there's still this like element that i that hasn't been addressed by the narrative so far that i find really frustrating about like all might wanting to pass down his his ability to someone who also takes the same position as symbol of peace and like number one hero and everything or i mean i guess he hasn't like i guess there are three things there's the the ability one for all symbol of peace and number one hero's position i guess the number one hero position and symbol of peace kind of go neck and neck or whatever they go together but like i just find it weird how like the expectation that alma has that whoever he passes on the ability to should also take the same position he had in society as being the number one because like that's not really I feel like Deku should be his own person and shouldn't be, you know, just filling out the same mold of all my you know, like he I mean, he's starting to do that with the, the kicking, but like I think All Might's, you know, direction I hope we go get to a point where it's like kind of addressed and it's like, okay, this this you trying to mentor someone to be exactly like you and to do exactly what you've done and nothing different kinda of, like nothing different in that aspect is going to be you know, addressed and kind of criticized, and then we'll, we'll look back and be like, "Okay, well, All Might had flawed ideas." They were, you know, to, to 
this question, I think, you know, better than Night Eye, but not pure, not like the best ideas. Like, I kind of feel like you need to let the, the ne- next generation do their own thing and, you know, let the, whoever happens to be the number one hero in the, in like, you know, I just feel like uh, it's admirable that All Might wants to, to train the next generation and wants to, like, ensure there is someone who could be a symbol of peace in the next generation. But, like, to expect that it has to be his successor and can't be anyone else who, you know, people admire for other reasons seems seems pretty weird. And also, like, logically doesn't really make much sense because, like, if they already suspect there's a connection between the two of them because their powers are similar, to have Deku become, like, the same, like, be the number one hero who inspires people as a symbol of peace... Like people would make that connection much, much more than they do already. So I don't know. Maybe that has to be addressed later. I kind of feel that MHA might go in that direction, like that it doesn't have to be like this set idea of what a symbol of peace should be, or there doesn't only have to be one symbol of peace. I mean, it's too early to say for sure because Midoriya's a character arc is very much it in following the footsteps of All Might. Mm. But I think it could eventually evolve in the future to him becoming his own hero, separate from, like, All Might's shadow and identity. Yeah, I hope so. I hope that, like, the arc of the series, you know, eventually includes him surpassing All Might and doing things that All Might, you know, maybe he'll still be around, but, like, All Might never considered. And, you know, I, I Mm. I hope a part of that is unlocking the, potentially the powers of the previous users of one for all. And then, you know, then maybe his power set is completely different than what All Might had. Yeah. So moving on to, I think, our final question here from Kevin Perales is, is Dobby a Todoroki and what do you think his backstory is? So we answered this question a long time ago during our MHA discussion. But since then, you know, uh, I got some clarification that... Uh, Todor- you know, I was reminded that Todoroki had brothers, and Dobby's quirk is fire-based related. He has scars on his face. Huh. So, you know, there there could be something there. If that's the case, as for what I would think his backstory would be, I think, like, you know, he just didn't live up to Endeavor's expectations, so Endeavor tossed him aside, probably gave him those scars, and so he decided to, you know goes through the path of villainy. Oh, okay. I, I had to, I had to like look him up real quick. And okay, I remember this guy now. And um, okay, with, with all this extra information, I'm starting to see why people have this theory going around. I honestly, I think there's strong enough evidence. Whereas, I think last time we answered this question, we were like, oh no, it couldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still not sure. I feel like it's, it's a problem with having. Very similar looking powers that everyone just assumes everyone's related to each other. So it's a tough, really thing to call right now. I doubt it, but maybe I don't know. You can make you can make that inference if you feel like it, but it's I'll have to wait until we get there, if we ever get there. Yeah, and I don't. I almost had completely forgotten about Dobby completely. <laughs> I mean, like looking at the page, I'm like, yeah, I remember this arc he was in, but like. I don't know, and that doesn't that isn't a good sign for this theory, because I feel like if it were setting it up him to be that big of a deal, probably should have been more memorable. Yeah, I mean, there's this one scene everyone latches onto with that is like where Todoroki like fails to like uh, grab Bakugo when you know he's being taken away, and Dobby's you know tells him like, "Oh, how sad for you, Todoroki," you know. So that's like one scene everyone latches onto. It, to as to like like oh could there be something there so that's one thing i remember about dobby but yeah he hasn't shown up a whole lot since the uh whole hideout raid thing so who knows what the what what plans or coach has for him well well here here's a here's a new theory um how do we know he's not related to um to ocean dub vegeta <laughs> i don't know is vegeta in the series uh, well, oh yeah, so. he he, cle- he clearly said the same line, you know, sad for you. That's that is clearly a a famous line from from the Ocean Double Dragon Ball Z, and you know, I think <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying d- d- genetics. It makes sense. It's a compelling theory. Th- th- thank you. I I I spent I spent at least like 14 hours coming up with it. Oh wow! <laughs> you, you should wow. you should share your uh, your charts and your graphs with me, you know. Yeah, Probably. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. I, I, I want to send them over the screw attack first, but I'll, I'll send them to you right afterwards. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff you're going to be sending to them. 
Oh boy. <laughs> but I think that this is from Christmas from Kenna Perales. We've answered ke- these questions from Kevin the Loner, Shagadelic One, Electro Dragonfly, and Love and Stuff on our manga fight. So we we'll, won't be answering them again here. But thank you for sending in those Christmas guys. But instead we'll be moving on to questions from Asterix Blue. His first question is, how could an American hero society tie in with Japan's? They just have them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's... I know that that's, like, obviously they're focusing on Japan right now because, duh. Uh, but I could I could see them having, like, sort of an international flavor eventually down the line. That that seems like a... I mean, even though the... the um, I think they, they described the, the whole um, sports festival stuff as essentially the Olympics... Olympics too, um, uh, but I, I would like to see maybe like an international flavor eventually down the line if they were to have them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd love to see the international hero society. I could see them going down a route of like making them the American society more like American comics, you know, like more like vigilantism and teams of heroes and things like that than the kind of like sh- super structured agency licensing. Um, yeah. Approach of Japan, um, it, a, a more a more capitalist society, um, <laughs> a more of like a I do a job you you pay me kind of thing. Yeah, um, I, there's this great article from uh, Nick Freeman uh, on Anime News Network where he like kind of described the difference between like the I, mindset of like American superhero comics and uh, My Hero Academia's world. In that, like, in my both My Hero Academia and One Punch Man, like, it isn't a question that there should be regulations for superheroes, but in stuff like Western comic books, like, that's, like, a big thing that a lot of uh, the characters fight against, the idea that, you know, the government should regulate superheroes, and they shouldn't just be left to do their own thing unchecked. So that would kind of be an interesting parallel to kind of explore in the series itself. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. So I guess moving on, the next question is, what kind of moves could Mineta learn to escalate the top hero status? Uh, uh, the spirit bomb? Uh, yes, a spirit bomb of sticky bombs, yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, you should get a bankai. Um, uh, a kamehameha of sticky balls, maybe? <laughs> M- maybe a, a, ooh, 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 a sticky ball armor? That could work. Oh, yeah, that's that, could, uh, that might actually... Yeah, that could be fun. Sticky ball armor. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that wouldn't help. That would just mean that everyone who comes into contact with you gets stuck to you, and then... Well, well yeah, but the, it would minimize damage. <laughs> it, I guess, yeah, I guess yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, you know what? Holy shit, I just thought of the best idea. It, it, Mineta will basically be the manga equivalent of Katamari Dema, uh, Dema, Demacy. <laughs> Demacy, Demacy. Demacy, yeah. He'll just be the manga equivalent to that. How awesome yeah, would that be, actually? <laughs> Prince of the Cosmos. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> now I just imagine Mineta covering himself in sticky balls and just rolling around collecting things. <laughs> <laughs> so honestly, yeah. I th- I think that's probably the best direction his character could go at this point. See, see, I think the the problem with that is that he um like in his current we currently know about his ability is like he could attach balls around his body and then roll up one layer of things but then the, that that layer of things wouldn't itself stick to new things so i think he needs to infuse his sticky balls with hockey and then it'll it, it'll transfer <laughs> yeah. the ability to the things he sticks to so like there then it'll keep, keep piling up like a like a katamari but will he have all types of hockey <laughs> he'll have of like, yeah, like supreme king hockey to, just to do it uh, i guess moving on to the next question what role will airy play in the eight precepts of death's plot and we kind of already learned this in one of the most recent chapters like overhaul is harvesting her quirk to nullify other people's quirks and putting them in drugs that he's distributing around to criminals and stuff so I think that's just is the straightforward answer to the question. Yeah, it's a shame the question kind of got answered by time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the next question is, should Mirio, Nedra, and Tamaki be fleshed out as important characters? Which, again, uh, you know, they're going to be involved in this most recent arc, so I think they're going to be important. So I think that also answers that question a little bit. And so I guess his final question is, how should the story transition from school to the workforce when Class 1A becomes seniors? Hmm. Dang. Let's see. It's not fantasy book too much, but I would assume that 
by then. I, I, the thing is, like, it would be. I wonder if it would be a lot tougher because um, the the one thing that really keeps the series a lot more fun is that you have these like all these groups together, these these students together. So them kind of separating. They all it, it it wouldn't it wouldn't really make sense to have everyone be in their own similar story at the same time, um, hmm. or at least it would it would it would kind of seem a little bit too forced to find to tie a bunch of these characters together for one singular story without being a little bit too forced. So I don't know just yet. I, well, one thing I'm curious. I mean, this is this question is about like once they graduate, but I'm just curious about how up until that point, you know, because like they they've established all these different like yearly events basically and so it's like you know if it goes on to a second year if they, they show them as second years and as third years are they going to repeat those events i mean it would make sense i mean to, to have like the, the school festival the sports festival again and stuff like that but like it, it kind of reminds me of like the way uh, like holidays are handled in sitcoms and they're like mm-hmm. they're not sitcom but like any kind of tv show where it's like Oh yeah, here like some of them recently, like Modern Family and uh, Brooklyn Nine Nine, have like made a tradition of like, like we're always going to have a Halloween episode and, and so on. But like traditionally, and and birthdays too. I'm thinking of like you know you don't like if you have like ten characters, you're not going to you know feature all ten birthdays every year. You're just going to like each year kind of like do a random selection based on what stories you want to tell. So maybe mm-hmm. if they keep doing it, like they won't show some of the like the but whatever they do for during the summer break, maybe won't be an important thing in the second and third year. But uh, I'm actually curious, like, because I haven't you know, like read too many manga in a similar situation like this where they're, they're aging through high school. I'm curious, like, is it standard for them to show all three years? Because I think of, like, Assassination Classroom, which is like, okay, this is one year, one year only. It still took yeah. however many years of serialization to get that. So, like, c- can you have a story like this that tells all three years? Well, Nisekoi showed all three, all three years. Oh, really? I mean, that's a rom-com, but, uh, I mean, towards the end, they did kind of, like... <laughs> rush through the second and third years, but uh, it, it, they could do it. And I guess I, in regards to events like the sports festival, I think that they could still make the sports festival interesting, revisiting it again in the same way like Dragon Ball's martial arts tournaments were mm. like a thing that happened every like three times. But, you know, all the all the tournaments were interesting and their own unique and different ways. So similarly, I think the sports festival could work like that too. They could do different things each time to mix things up. I was going to put Skep Dance out there, but then I remembered that the manga technically starts them off in their second year of high school. We get to see their their first year of high school bits and pieces because that's when they form their club. But I guess that's kind of an entry, but not really. Um, But uh, actually, I, I had an idea. I wonder... I, I feel like something we're not we're not considering is I feel like at some point there's a, there's a possibility for maybe the the society of My Hero Academia to just possibly just crumble before they can even graduate high school. Hmm. Hmm. That could happen. Yeah, with the way things are escalating, for sure. I, I feel like somehow this like superhero quirk society could just like possibly tumble on itself or somehow the the villains just start like all the villains of the world just somehow you know find the opportunity to up uh to form an uprise and you know basically things go to shit and maybe 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 then we'll have a time skip of like uh three years later or something and everybody's still trying to recover and uh or something like that i don't know it's hmm. i don't i feel like it it could happen but uh but I, I feel like m- m- maybe maybe they'll go through all three years of their high school with no problems whatsoever. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure that would happen. I formed a grand unifying theory. So so Luffy comes in, right? And he teaches uh-huh. he teaches Kirishima hockey. Okay. And then he, he uses hockey on his hardening ability. And then he turns the world to stone. And then 10,000 years later, we have Dr. Stone. So that, that's my theory. Oh, oh wow. That's... <laughs> that's a great way to have a crossover between those series. <laughs> Man, you should, like, you, should, you should send that over to Screw Attack. <laughs> I think those are some fun ideas of how to transition. I, I, I like I like Jeff's the best. Thing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> but I, th- I think there is potential. Like while they're working in hero agencies, like we're seeing now that there's this, like there's this front between different hero agencies, and so I think there's potential for there to be you know like each arc to focus. Like I don't think we, even if we lose the framing of them all being in the same class, I think there are enough like you know each arc focus on a different. uh 
you know, pairing of three different hero agencies which gets you like a, you know, gets you eight different characters. And then the next arc, you get a different mm-hmm. pairing, a different combination of eight characters or something. I think that's because even when you have all the kids in the class, you can't really focus on all of them. There's still characters that are almost completely in the background. And, you know, like uh, Todoroki, we didn't really, he like, was shown a couple of times, but didn't really get focused until the sports festival arc. And so there's potential like that. Like, you know, they won't be in the background anymore, but they'll just, they'll get their own focus eventually. I, I think there's potential for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, there, it's just like it just being able to creatively shuffle all these characters around and have interesting stories. And, and even if you're just focusing on like Aoyama or someone, I don't know, uh, <laughs> you, it, it can be done. I, I think at least he, this, this track record has been, were, have been proving very well so far with the, with the series. So I don't think uh, I'm too worried if they want to do that. So Yeah, and there's, there's still the framing of like, competing in the hero ranking to you know like once uh deku gets if he like becomes number one or whatever then it's like okay i don't know where, know where the series can go from there like how long it could survive at that before it has to talk about has, has to just be about like passing it down but uh i think there's still tons of material to potentially be gained from like when they're in the workforce and trying to you know build up his own like, making it you could have them in agencies then starting their own agencies then there's lots of potential there but yeah uh, yeah mm-hmm. I think, uh, yeah, those are some good answers, I think. Um, it'd be really interesting to see what the series does when it gets to that point, if it does. But our final set of questions come from Rated M for Manatees, who asks, what is the most over- overrated aspect of the series so far, and what is the most underrated aspect of the series so far? All right, I'm going to throw a hot take out here. Um, oh, oh, no, oh, no. I think the most overrated aspect of the series is that it's about superheroes. Yeah, <laughs> actually, I would agree with that. Okay. Um, in the sense that, like, I feel like it's not, it's people with powers, yeah, and I think, like, everyone's sort of doing their own, like, I, I don't mind the society part of it, I think it's kind of cool, it's just, it's just like, uh, I don't know, I, I feel like I've I've seen this enough, or at least I'm kind of, it's hard for me to be invested in the, um, the superhero aspect, especially if I, since I'm, like, engage, if I'm actively consuming a lot of, like, cape uh, comic books already so it's just like okay that's kind of that's an interesting gimmick f- just to get the premise across about this one kid with this one special power but um uh, other than that it's not it's not like the thing that is like the like it's not the most be all end all series that that makes superheroes obsolete at this point this is the one that's always going to be that it it does a good job at it and it's it's still yeah. it still has a lot of the shonen aspects to it the shonen manga aspects to it that i you can make this about anything it could be about ninjas it could be about uh cops it could be about uh, accountants accountants <laughs> like with superpowers uh but it, it like it, it's there's enough in there that i feel like it's it's not it's not special but it's they do a good job with with the material that they have and it that just i mean I'm, i might blow out of proportion by saying it's overrated but it's just like oh it's like not the most interesting aspect of it. It's not like it hasn't been done before. Yeah. Yeah, that's the angle I'm going to get. It's not the most interesting thing about MHA. Yeah. Is that it's about superheroes. There are, like, more ideas and themes that it's exploring. Yeah. About, like... like the stories, like, uh, having the char- the way the characters are growing, uh, the way they interact with each other, the morals, everything that's coming out of it is very good. I think that's the most interesting por- parts of the series but just like it being in the in the shell the cookie shell of uh superheroes is not the most like okay it's nice but the creamy center is the, the stuff i really care about i i do agree with that but I, I i'd also like to just to your point i'd also like to say that it's i personally like uh, part of the reason i like my hero academia a lot is while i do agree that you know the fact that it's about superheroes isn't really like it's that's not the most interesting aspect about it. I mean, like the One Punch Man exists. Like th- there are manga out there. It's My Hero Academia is not the only manga about superheroes. And even as far as just Japanese media goes in general, like it's not like uh, it's not like Japanese media doesn't already delve into superheroes a lot. I mean, look at like stuff like the Sentai franchise or Common Rider or whatever. Um, but I will say something I've always enjoyed about My Hero Academia is that um, I I enjoy seeing. Um, seeing that superhero comic influence in a shonen manga, I think it makes for a very interesting and uh, visually pleasing aesthetic, especially when it comes to 
characters specifically designed in that light, like All Might. Um, so, so I think that's what makes it visually interesting. But I, but I do agree. Yeah, it's yeah, the, the, like like the wit. It's it's basically window dressing, and that's not really like the most interesting aspect about it. I would agree. My Hero Academia has interesting to, things to say about heroism, and its perspective on heroes is a little bit different than Western hero comic books. Uh, but again, yeah, I think that just in general, like. There's more to MHA than it's just a manga about superheroes. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that the powers themselves, like I keep like being like, oh yeah, I should like this more. There are like cool powers and stuff, and I t- I tend to like things that you know, like have cool powers. But then I'm like, there aren't that. I just feel like them when they fight and they end up using their cool powers, it doesn't in the abstract feel that different from like when ninjas are fighting and they happen to have fire ice powers and things. You know, it's yeah. like. It's yeah. kind of it's kind of like I think we come to expect it that like in battle manga, once they battle, there will be cool powers being used. So it's like when you look back, it's like oh, I kind of forgot that they all have like the quirks. What I mean, not you don't actually forget that, but you know what I mean. That it's like yeah. it doesn't it doesn't feel that different in that aspect. So it's like everyone says like <laughs> oh yeah, it's superpowers and superheroes and stuff. But it's like okay, but like when you're in day to day reading, it doesn't feel that that aspect doesn't feel super present compared to other series. Yeah. Like they could be psychic, they could be wizards. Like, it <laughs> still works. <laughs> yeah. So that's an overrated aspect. We feel MHA is, but what about an underrated aspect? Sometimes I feel like uh, people don't give enough credit to uh, some of the characters. Like I feel like uh, I feel like Midoriya probably i i feel like he doesn't get enough credit as the main character because i think he's a, a legitimately relatable and interesting main character when he wants to be hmm. yeah i think the character writing in image is strong and i feel like people who criticize the series as a generic shonen with you know stock archetypes are really not giving the series enough credit for its character writing and like how it executes its tropes and yeah it's, it's like it's like it's it's like Doctor said, like this is still very shonen, but like I feel like it's still I personally feel like it executes its tropes very meaningfully, and I feel like executes them in certain ways that I don't feel like we see in other shonen manga super often. Yeah, I mean mm-hmm. what I was gonna say for like the most underrated aspect is just how it's like I think about this a lot in terms of like when people talk about the series and they kinda of write it off especially with the anime at least i mean the anime was the first season was particularly slowly paced but like they'd be like yeah. oh yeah it, it's like it's well executed but like it was just so like bland shonen and like it was just like pure shonen and i was like i don't really want just pure shonen and it's like it, it is like it does have a lot of those tropes and i can see why people say that but it also like it really defies a bunch of tropes or it doesn't defy them i think it's like novel and how it uses them or it, like it goes for the it uses them differently it uses them differently but also like it kind of I think of this a lot in comparison to Black Clover, and I feel like Black Clover leans very heavily into using the tropes in the most effective way, in the most like not the most like not that this is less effective, but that it's like goes for the the most uh, efficient, like the easiest to pull off and the most uh, bang for yeah. buck. And so it's like, and if you're used to seeing those mm-hmm. tropes, then Black Clover can feel like okay, well you're just like repeating things I've already seen before. But if you're not, then it's like. Yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely how mm-hmm. I felt about Black Clover at the start. But we 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 talked about that for two hours. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll yeah, yeah. But so I, I bet if you like, if you're not used to that, then reading Black Clover, you're like, oh my god, so many emotional highs and lows. But but where is I? Um, my Hero Academia. And I feel like I put uh, World Trigger in a similar boat, actually, where it's like it doesn't it like it takes more time to earn some of the things, and, mm-hmm. and a lot of people can just read that as being bland. But because it doesn't like it doesn't ride the the roller coaster as hard, but it like I'm just thinking I'm also thinking of the um during the sports festival when Deku, um basically like chooses to lose against Todoroki to get him to have a revelation so that he can like unlock his his firepower and use it whatever and it's like that that um like inspiring him to to grow as a person is like in the abstract so similar to what Asta does every every arc every page by just being there but like it's so much more earned it's so it's it's a much harder thing to execute and like in the abstract it's like yeah it's the same like it's the same emotional wave but it's like it's so much more effort was put into it it's a much harder task to pull off it feels i think if you're reading into the details it feels much more rewarding but if you're just like not reading the details it's like yeah okay well it's just shown any but it's like it's it it pulls off it, it works harder for this similar tropes 
and there's more depth there if you read into it, I think. Yeah. 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 I'd agree with that. But I think that does it. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for sending in your Q&As. This was a pretty healthy-sized Q&A episode, <laughs> two hours. I think, uh, I guess we made a good call of uh, of saving this for its own thing. <laughs> But yeah, thank you guys for sending in your questions. Uh, we really appreciate it. And if you have any more questions to send us about, you know, just about anything, make sure to send those to mangamavericks at gmail.com. And I want to thank you guys for all coming on the show and discussing some more MHA with us today. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. I, I am, I am academia out at this point now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Doc's like, okay, finally, I never have to talk about the stupid series again. <laughs> no, no, I, but I really enjoyed it. I think it's it, it's it's going through several different roller. It was a roller coaster of a ride, I'll say that. So, but I came out of it uh, really enjoying the series, and now having to at least watch uh, or at least read it every other week would be a lot more <laughs> beneficial for myself and my sanity. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and thanks for having me on. I think, like I mentioned before, it's like at the end of the last episode, it's like by inspecting the series and or going back and rereading parts, it's like I think it it really I gained a lot more appreciation for it. I went into it being like, oh, my hero academia, meh, waiting for something big to happen, and now I'm like, oh yeah, like I think when you go into each arc not knowing how the arc's going to turn out, it's like, oh, that wasn't that surprising. Oh well, but if you go into it knowing how it's going to turn out, you're like, oh yeah, the character beats. Like I I love all these little character beats and like. Um, going through the anime re- recently and it's like oh yeah like if you know how things are going to turn out I feel like it's so much more easy to appreciate those little character things and the series is great when you go in that detail that level and so, so thanks for uh, encouraging me to, to go back and look at it again. Yeah no problem this yeah this the series is definitely I think a lot more rewarding on a reread as I've also learned and a lot of fun to discuss with other people I mean it's a it's a, it's a series with a lot to it that's worth appreciating and worth discussing and I, I, we've had some great conversations today so I just want to thank you guys again. This was a lot of fun. So, Jeff, where can the good people find you? Uh, I host a podcast called Podigist, talking about Digimon. We're currently covering Digimon Frontier. And I'm also on Twitter at Jeff Only Jeff. And you can occasionally find me on on the Shonen Jump podcast. Occasionally. Not as a regular host, but on some episodes. Um, that's about it. And Doctor, how about you? Yeah, I, I run the Aspector's Enemy podcast over at ssaapodcast.com. Uh, new episode hopefully will be out soonish. I'm going to be actually recording it later today, <laughs> with the day we record this episode. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at ssaapodcast. And I also run Jessica Gintama podcast over at gintamapodcast.com. Plenty of ways to find me. Mm-hmm. And speaking of Gintama podcast, Colton. Where can the people find your stuff? Well, uh, I also run another Gintama podcast because I just like to throw a wrench into things like that. Um, <laughs> you can uh, you can find that. That's Life Lessons, the Gintama manga cast over at gintalifelessons.wordpress.com. And uh, you can also uh, listen to One Podcast Prevails, where we, uh, me and Doc actually like to talk about uh, the Detective Conan slash Case Closed manga as it's still being released by Viz Media. Uh, we've been covering... Uh, well, he's he's technically been covering the series from the very beginning. I just kind of happened to jump on for the ride. Um, and, uh, you know, he's been covering uh, uh, the manga from the very beginning as sort of a retrospective kind of thing. Uh, hopefully we'll be recording another episode of that pretty soon. And uh, you can find that at one podcast prevails dot wordpress dot com. And uh, I should probably mention before I forget, uh, you can also find me on Twitter at Sniper King 323. That's S-N-I-P-E-R-K-I-N-G 323. Uh, and that's about it. Cool. And you can find me on Twitter at at Lumromayasha, and you can also find me on Amateur Revelation. Outside of this podcast, I'm start writing more reviews of manga for all comic, so you can keep an eye out for those when they get published. And as for the podcast as a whole, you can find it on allcomic.com and iTunes. And you can also find us on our YouTube page. Just search for Manga Mavericks. It's the first search result, thankfully. Remember, guys, we need a 100 subscribers to get that custom URL. So please like and subscribe our content on there. And if you have any feedback or suggestions for us, uh, rate and leave us a review on iTunes. And send us any feedback and questions to us at our email, magamavericks at gmail.com. Uh, follow us on Twitter as well. 
Uh, yes, follow us on Twitter as well at at manga ma- underscore mavericks and on Tumblr at manga mavericks.tumblr.com. That's the places where you can best follow the podcast and keep up with the updates of our show and what will be coming down the pipes next. And we sure have a lot of podcasts coming down the pipes in May. But uh, I think that does it for this very special MHA Q&A special. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Sayonara. Bye-bye.